Good afternoon, and welcome to the Food for Thought lecture series. My name is Christina Crowder, and I'm a senior honors nutrition and dietetics major from Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is my third and final year serving on the honors student board, and I'd like to just take a moment to recognize uh, my colleagues on the board. We have uh, Mr. Chris Sims, who is the chair of the board. He's right there at the back. Ms. Callie Sullivan, director. Will Pullman, director. Colton Tester, director. And here in the back we have Dr. Kurt Rome, who serves as the Honor Board Director. He's the Interim Dean of the Honors College, and he's also a horticulture professor. So this man is of many talents, and I'm very grateful for him. Um, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about the Honors Board. It was established to serve as the student voice in the Honors Program, furthering scholastic achievement through leadership development and collaboration with other organizations across campus. The vision of the Dale Bumpers College of Agriculture, Food, and Life Sciences is to prepare graduates who are intellectually enriched, technically competent, environmentally conscious, and ethically responsible. In support of our vision, the Food for Thought lecture series serves to educate and inspire our students and the community. Previous speakers in this series, which was created in 2013, include U.S. Senator John Bozeman, Dr. Rajiv Shah, Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and Mr. Charlie Arno, CEO of the Center for Food Integrity. I'd like to thank Dean Beta for his support of the Food for Thought lecture series, the Honors Program, and the Honors Student Board. Without his guidance and support and belief in us, this series would not be in existence. Today's lecture will be concluded with a question and answer session, and we ask that if you have a question, you raise your hand and wait to be called on. If you are called on, Please stand, identify yourself with your name, your hometown, and your major or department, and please keep your questions concise so that we can maximize the time we have allotted. It is an honor and privilege to introduce Ms. Kathleen McLaughlin, President of the Walmart Foundation and Senior Vice President of Global Sustainability. Ms. McLaughlin earned a Bachelor Degree of Science in Electrical Engineering from Boston University, where she was a trustee scholar and graduated summa cum laude. From there, she was selected as a Rhodes Scholar and went on to Oxford University to earn a Bachelor of Arts in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics with a Diploma in Theology. She served as the Director of the Toronto Community Foundation for 10 years, where she held various roles, including Chair of the Community Issues Committee that oversaw initiatives and grant making to Toronto NGOs that addressed poverty, hunger, housing, and immigrant integration issues. She spent more than 20 years with the consulting firm McKinsey & Company, where she was a senior partner based in Toronto. As director of the firm's social and innovation practice, she helped develop solutions to social challenges for institutions around the world. She led numerous successful engagements, such as accelerating country ownership of the HIV AIDS response in Africa, redesigning the global organization of a major foundation to improve its effectiveness, and helped an international agency develop a strategy to engage the private sector in advancing nutrition. In the firm's retail practice division, she worked with companies in the Americas, Europe, and Asia to increase efficiency and drive growth by expanding into emerging markets, leading large-scale cost reductions resulting in 15 to 20 percent improvements. She currently serves as president of the Walmart Foundation and vice president of global sustainability. The Walmart Foundation is a charitable foundation in support of hunger relief and healthy eating, sustainability, women's economic empowerment, and career opportunity. The foundation also supports veterans and their families and aids in disaster relief. In 2013 alone, this foundation gave $1.3 billion in cash and in-kind contributions locally and globally to give back around the world. Please help me welcome Ms. Kathleen McLaughlin. Thanks, Christina, and thanks, Dr. Veda and Kurt, and to all of you, the, the board, for having me here uh, today. I'm delighted to be with you. And it's so nice just to drive down the road to talk to some folks. Uh, it's great to be here in Arkansas. Um, I would love to start with a simple proposition, which is that business exists to serve society. This is a picture of uh, a store, one of Mass Mart stores in South Africa. It's in Soweto, in the townships. And maybe the second week that I was on the job at Walmart, I went with Doug McMillan, who's now the CEO of Walmart, down to South Africa with a few other folks. And we went to the store. And I was standing there, and I was watching 
people kind of go in and out with their shopping carts, you know, families shopping with their kids, and they were putting things in their baskets, rooster rice and all kinds of things that I know from my previous development work they did not have access to even five years ago in this place. And while we were there, one of the guys that we were with, one of the um, directors of, of the company, was coaching the guy behind the counter in the deli saying, listen, don't let the chicken, the raw chicken, touch the vegetables, you know, the food safety issues. And again, a level of food safety and kind of discipline that those people didn't have access to in the stores where they used to shop, which were really just street markets before. And it, I looked at it and I thought, you know what, this is a form of development. It's different from the maternal health clinics or the HIV AIDS clinics where I was working before, but very much development to provide access to food that's safe, a much wider variety of items that's affordable uh, to people. That in and of itself is a social good. This proposition, business exists to serve society, has been at the heart of the debate in business over the last 10, 20 years about what is the role of business in society. And you know, I remember when I was a consultant at McKinsey, I would often go talk to some clients and they'd say, oh, you know, you gotta help us. What, you know, what's our, what's our proposition to society? We've got some reputational issues. So we're thinking of launching a project to do with women, or we're gonna launch a project to do with lung cancer. It had nothing to do with the business. And so, you know, I'd always say, well, let's start with what do you do for a living? What's your business, first and foremost? And if you can't articulate how that is good for the environment or for social issues or what have you, you should just stop right there. That has to be okay first. And then you can kind of go beyond that and say, well, how do we use our strengths to help other people? And really, over the last 20 years, you've seen a progression in business of the way people articulate and, and try to define how they help society from you know, maybe back in 1990, when I started in the business world, it was all about shareholder value. And I remember when I first joined McKinsey, I spent a month uh, at kind of a boot camp learning how to calculate net present value, because that's what it was about. And pretty much every project that I was involved with for the next year was how do we enhance shareholder value through whatever it was. So customers, employees, everything else was a means to an end. It was all about driving shareholder value. Then through the 90s, you saw people start to use concepts of double bottom line, triple bottom line, and they'd been around in academia for a long time, but they hadn't really seeped into the consciousness of business until, I'd say, mid-90s. And people started to say, well, wait a minute. You know, we ought to at least take care of our immediate stakeholders. So yeah, we can drive shareholder value, but we ought to do it in a way that takes care of our employees and the customers and suppliers and communities and so on, and let's try to do both at the same time. Now what you're starting to see is the leading companies going well beyond that to say, how do we collaborate with others, not only other companies in sort of a pre-competitive way, but with governments, with civil society organizations, with citizens? How do we collaborate to strengthen the systems that we rely on? So it's, just, it's not just our shareholders and our customers or immediate stakeholders, but it's going beyond to say we're drawing out of systems, natural systems, human capital, natural capital. How do we replenish that? And how do we make the systems that we rely on sustainable into the future? And that's where the leading companies are going. That's the reason I joined Walmart about a year and a half ago was to be part of that more directly. Because I had been working at McKinsey as Christina said, I was leading something called the social innovation practice, which was all about getting private sector companies to engage more in social issues and environmental issues in kind of a double bottom line way. And the more exciting projects were the ones that looked at things much more systemically. So when I got the call from folks at Walmart saying, hey, you ought to come down and look at this job, my thought was, wow, this is the largest company in the world, has extraordinary assets, I'll go down there and see, are they serious about this? Because you know, in my time at McKinsey, I had served a lot of retailers as clients, pretty much everybody who competes with Walmart and never Walmart. So I didn't know much about Walmart, other than kind of outside in as a competitor of my clients. So I thought, I'll just go down and see what this is all about. So I flew down here, and I met with the leadership team at the time, and to a person, I thought, you know what, these guys are serious. They have big aspirations. They are a mission-driven company, and they actually want to use the assets of the company to go well beyond immediate stakeholders and work on the systems that they rely on. And that's where I join. So I thought today I would talk about the key success factors that I have seen through my work at Walmart, but then also before with many other companies in different contexts, about what it takes for a business, if this is true, and if your goal is 
to strengthen society, what are the key success factors uh, for doing that? And what's kind of at the cutting edge of, of practice today? And I was interested to hear that Rod Shaw was here earlier. He's one of the folks that we work with, and he's very passionate about this. And maybe before I go into the, some of the success factors, I'll just spend a minute talking about, about Raj. Um, you know, he's somebody who came out of the private sector, was at the Gates Foundation before he went to USAID, then he went to USAID. And his vision was to say, we can't be successful as a country lending assistance to other countries in development unless we engage the private sector. And he recognized right away that the uh, procurement mechanisms in the US government just didn't lend themselves to do that. So he made a bunch of changes to things, creating the Global Development Lab, you know, coming at things in a very different way to try to pursue development goals in a multi-sector way. So this type of thing that you see going on in Africa now, the incredible investment and in elevation in GDP, elevation in the economy, I mean, this is the way development is happening. And you've got folks like USAID kind of working right alongside many others to develop it. And I'll give a couple examples um, today. So let's talk about some of the key success factors. First is that if you're a company and you're saying, well, you know, I, th I think I've got my house in order. I think my basic you know, business proposition is pretty good. I want to go beyond that. The first thing it has to be relevant to your mission. So, you know, I, I mentioned in my um, example, you know, sometimes companies will say, well, you know, I'd like to do a project in X, and it has nothing to do with what they do for a living. It has to be something that's relevant to what you do and your mission to build off that. It, why? Because um, you need to engage the hearts and minds of the people that you have working for you. And you're going to want to draw on the assets that are particular to your company. So you have to kind of start with what, you know, what is your mission. And just by way of example, um, this is the, the Walmart agenda. So if you said, okay, well, what are we trying to do in terms of environmental and social issues? This is it. And I'm, I'm showing this to you not to advertise Walmart, but just to give you a sense of how it works for an example company. It's the one I know best right now. So if you look at Walmart, we've said there are three things, sustainability, opportunity, and community. Why those three things? Well, if we are in the business of bringing products and services from wherever they get made to where people want to use them all over the world, we're in 27 countries now, and we sell everything from food to apparel to general merchandise to electronics, I mean, you name it, everything short of you know, automobiles and heavy building supplies, that's moving around a lot of stuff. So we better do that in a way that's sustainable for the environment, that has the minimum footprint possible. We better do it in a way that takes care of the people who work in those supply chains, and that's all along the chain, including our own people. And we need to do it in a way that strengthens the communities, not only where we operate in terms of stores, but the communities that we're sourcing from. And you can think of it as both trying to address externalities that the business might create inadvertently, right? So if we're, if we're manufacturing, or, or, or I should say selling things that require a lot of manufacturing, well, then that's emitting a lot of carbon. That's an externality. Something has to be done about that, right? So on the one hand, it's mitigating externalities. But on the other hand, it's saying, well, there's, there's some skills there, and there's some reach, and we could use those to do positive going, going, going in the other direction. So these are our priorities. Sustainability, it's our own footprint. So we're trying to get to 100% renewable energy. We're just over 25% now globally of all of our electricity needs coming from renewable sources. And we're trying to get to 100. We have a roadmap um, about how we'll do it and you know, the timing. Um, we want to generate zero waste. So we've managed to reduce waste by about 85% in our store operations. So that's all the cardboard coming in, the plastics, the metals, all those things. So we've managed to get it down, the food waste, we've managed to get it down quite a bit. We've got a ways to go. Um, and then even things like water, we don't use a lot of water in our stores, but to the extent that we do, we're, you know, we're working on that. So that's our own footprint. Food. Food is our biggest business. And the other side of the coin, we're the largest food company in the world, largest food retailer in the world. If you look at estimates from the UN, other sources, they say that roughly by 2050, we need to generate an incremental 70% in food supply to feed the planet. So there'll be about 9.5 billion people by then, 70% increase in food. Where's that going to come from? Now, some of it can come from waste reduction. There is a lot of waste in the food system, both upstream, you know, things left on the field that can't get to market and so on, and downstream in our kitchens, 
half the waste is in our kitchens. I don't know about you guys, I, my husband, we're throwing out a lot of you know, bologna and everything else every week, so a lot of it's there. Um, but that's that, even that's not enough. If we, if we got rid of food waste entirely, that would only solve half the problem. So where is this food going to come from in a way that doesn't cut down every last tree, use every last drop of water? Right? We can't keep converting land for food production. So how do we do it? What about equity issues? Who can even afford to get food? You, know, you look at this world, there's, there's a rising obesity problem, and we still have malnutrition and undernutrition. So as we look at the food system, those are the issues we see. And we say, well, OK, we can do something about this. We're actually a fairly major player in the food chain. Uh, we certainly don't control it, but we have a lot of relationships. And we can set out a vision. We can collaborate and work with partners. And so the four things that we're trying to work on are true cost, lowering the true cost of food. We call it resilient sourcing. So if we look at where all of the 150 food crops that we source come from, which ones are at risk? Where is their water stress? Where are their land conversion issues? Where are their fertilizer issues? Water runoff, all of those kind of things. And what's that heat map look like? And then where can we focus to try to reduce the true cost of food production? And I'll talk about some examples in a minute. But that's, you know, that's important. And then by the same token, smallholder farmers who are working to produce that food, it's a massive part of the food system. How do we protect their livelihoods, help them increase their yields, help them increase their income and be more sustainable? And that's where some of our partnerships with USAID and other folks come in. So that's one. Second is access to food. So we spend an awful lot of time worrying about the price of food and trying to make it affordable for people in our stores, wherever they are in the world. But we also recognize there are people who can't even afford that. So our food program and donations into the food system, trying to create a more sustainable and healthier charitable meal system, so having a strong cold chain and so on, um, that's an important priority. Healthier food. You know, we were just talking, Christina and I, before about the intersection between food and health and wellness and the realization that food is medicine. So trying to make healthier food more affordable and more available. And, and I'll give you a couple stats in a minute. And then finally, transparency and food safety. You know, what's in your food? What are the ingredients? Where did it come from? We, we don't have traceability anywhere in the world, including this country. So you know, if you look at the beef supply chain, we've set a goal saying we want 15% of our beef to be fully traceable back to the farm. That sounds like nothing. But just to get to that 15% in the next couple of years is going to require a Herculean effort. And, the, and that's true in many parts of the world. So that's the food system. And then we saw, as I said, a lot of other things. So our goal is to reduce the true cost of manufacturing and materials. So about a year and a half ago, we announced that we're reducing or removing chemicals of concern from products. We've been working really closely with the Environmental Defense Fund on that. We're looking at materials, packaging, recycled content, um, you know, again, toxicity of, of materials that house products, especially hard goods, and trying to improve that. Factory energy efficiency. Uh, so we've been working in China across the factory base there to try to get a 30% improvement in energy efficiency. Why? It's not just because it helps the cost structure of the items. It's because in China, their predominant source of energy is brown power, is coal-fired plants. So if we can reduce the draw on the grid, it actually um, puts less stress on that system. And it's something the Chinese are really going to have to grapple with. And it's part of the climate deal that they negotiated with the US. So you know, ultimately, we would love to see a circular economy where everything that gets sold comes back in some way. It either gets recycled or reused, repurposed, and we've got a complete co closed loop. It's probably a ways away, but that's what we're working toward. Opportunity. You would have seen our announcements last week, I guess two weeks ago now, about our own associate base and what we're providing in terms of wage structure. Um, you know, we've elevated the starting wage to it'll be $10 a year from now. And then $15 is an entry level kind of middle skills job and up from there. Uh, a bunch of um, work around upskilling and training, new scheduling practices, and so on. That's uh, really focused on our own internal workforce. Again, trying to have our own house in order. And then beyond that, working with a number of populations on opportunity. So working with uh, women. We have a very significant women's economic empowerment initiative, again, back in our supply chain helping to train women who are farmers, working in factories, and so on, sourcing more from women-owned businesses. You know, If you look in this country at the level of entrepreneurialism and small businesses owned by men versus by women, we're trying to elevate that and make it easier for women in business. So why not source from them? 
Um, we announced also alongside the retail announcements of a couple weeks ago in the foundation, a $100 million program, which will be around the retail sector more broadly. So working with other retailers and trying to accelerate people moving from frontline to middle skills jobs. Veterans, reintegration, we've been working with veterans a long time. You know, again, we've been hiring veterans and we have ways of working in the community to accelerate their reintegration into civilian life. And then finally, uh, in community. So through the foundation, we have a pretty robust local community grants program and engagement in philanthropy locally. We also, um, for many years, have been working in disaster relief and increasingly resiliency, trying to help communities be more prepared for disaster. So I've spent a fair bit of time on this, but I, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the richness of if, if the company is pursuing initiatives that are relevant to its mission, just how deep and broad it can be. And if you look at some of the other interesting examples out there, Unilever, NRG, Nike, you'd see the same kinds of things where companies are saying, look, we have a particular mission in life. Let's then go beyond that and pursue things that are going to be relevant to, to that and to our customers. Second big thing, and it's a key off right from that, which is draw on the particular assets of the company. So let me just take a second and I'll talk about the food program and how we're using particular assets that are unique uh, to Walmart. So number one, food donations into the charitable system. So I mentioned we donate about a billion dollars of food per year. That's a massive asset that we have. And you know we've got it because we're a big food company. We sell a lot of food. And guess what? We can't sell all of it. So those peaches that are starting not to look so great or that cereal that's coming to the end of its shelf life, it's still perfectly fine. It's still perfectly edible. Let's get it out and into somebody's belly before it goes bad. And so we've focused on that and said, well, guess what else we have? We have refrigerated trucks. We have a lot of logistics experts all over this country. So we have 100 people across the country that are on food bank boards. And they're providing expertise to the local food bank about how to optimize the distribution center to run efficiently. We've donated over 100 trucks, half of them refrigerated trucks. Because again, we don't want to just donate any food. We want to donate really healthy food, which is generally perishable. So we need a cold chain to keep the stuff cold. Flash freezing in the store. It was flash freeze it and then get it on the truck and get it into the food bank system. So that's one example. Um, a second example would be in nutrition. We've got great product developers. So we had made a commitment a couple years back with the White House that we would reformulate food. We would eliminate trans fats. We would reduce sodium by 25%. We reduce sugar by 10% and work with our food scientists to do that in our own private label. And then guess what? We also have relationships with all the food companies. So we said, OK, we'll work with them too. So we'll ask our suppliers to do the same thing. And you know, because we're all living in the same system, they were getting similar pressure from their stakeholders to do the same thing. So things start to move in the same direction. You can go faster and farther. Um, marketing. We have marketing skills. We said, what if we created a great for you icon that would be based on a pretty rigorous nutrition standard about what's in the food in terms of nutritional composition and what's not in the food. So it shouldn't have any trans fat, um, low sodium threshold, and so on. And we could put that on the front of pack for our private label items, and that would make it a lot easier for customers who get confused about nutrition to figure out, well, what should I be eating? So again, that's an asset we have. We can use it. Our purchase order, we can source more from women-owned businesses. So if we want to elevate the status of women in the food chain and give a boost to women entrepreneurs, there are a lot of female entrepreneurs in the food chain, all kinds of you know, tortilla companies, to you name it. Let's do that. So we will commit to source an incremental $20 billion from women-owned businesses, a lot of them in the food chain. We'll use our purchase order. That is an asset. So these are some examples of, of how we've been able to go well beyond just you know, writing a check through our foundation to make a difference in the food chain. We also do some of that. right? So we agreed that we would spend uh, about $40 million in nutrition education. And we do that through the foundation. So we, we make grants to people who educate people on how do you shop a store? How do you shop the perimeter? Maybe don't go down the middle aisles. Right? How do you cook something nutritious, especially if you're on a budget? So if I have $100 this week and I need to feed my family of four on the weeknights, what could I make that's nutritious? And then what about the cost? So we also said, well, let's find a way to reduce the price of the healthier food. So we took about $3.5 billion out of the price of fruit and vegetables in two years. 
and we're still working on lowering it further. And then we said, okay, let's take packaged goods and let's take the healthier version of every SKU, of every item. So you have, you know, tomato soup and then you have the low sodium tomato soup. Let's look at them side by side and see what the price difference is. And why is it that the healthier version is more expensive than the unhealthy version? Because most of the time the healthier version is missing something that the unhealthy version has. You'd think it'd be cheaper, right? It's got actually has less ingredients. So we've been working on that. When we started, we had about a 6%, 6.1% price delta. We've got it down to 5.1 in a couple years. Fairly slow pace. I'd like to see it going faster, but we're trying to get it down to zero and then ideally you know, even less. So that the healthy version of any choice set is cheaper. Um, we actually believe in aggregate that it's a myth that you have to be wealthy to eat healthy food. You know, as we do basket analysis and look at what you can put together, you can eat in a healthy way for a low price, but you actually have to know how to cook, and, that, and that's a big problem, which is why a lot of our nutrition education investments are going into teaching people how, how to cook and how can you prepare something quickly if you're time starved on a budget. So those are some examples of, of using the unique assets of the company. Um, third thing is innovate to drive a, bottom, a double bottom line. And what I mean by that is, you know, I mentioned earlier the sort of double bottom line thinking, meaning, okay, any company can create financial value, shareholder value, but you can also create value for society. Some people talk about the triple bottom line, right? So financial, social, environmental, however you want to think about it. Um, most companies, until recently, thought that was an interesting concept and they sort of notionally thought of that, but really they were tracking the financial stuff. No one's off measuring greenhouse gas, you know, or social welfare or what have you as part of the company metrics. That is starting to change. And you are seeing a proliferation of measurement schemes, whether it's CDP, right, Carbon Disclosure Project, or folks like TSC, thank you very much, University of Arkansas, Sustainability Consortium and the Sustainability Index, which are starting to put some harder metrics on these things. And Companies need to spend as much um, brain power, creativity, focus on defining what those metrics are going to be and measuring those as they do the financial ones. And it is hard. You know, I can tell you right now, and in the sustainability portfolio at Walmart, we have a bunch of projects in the portfolio. I showed you what those were. Those are basically our projects on that other page. Um, and we are spending a lot of money just to count what we're doing on greenhouse gas. That's not even the money we have to spend on the teams to kind of reduce the greenhouse gas. This is just trying to figure out where are we. So it's not easy yet, but the companies that are really leading in this area are investing in this and trying to find ways to drive it further. So one of the things that we um, recently did last fall at the UN Climate Change Summit, we made a commitment that we would ask our suppliers to start tracking three metrics in the food chain. Yields, water consumption, and GHG, and that we would do this through the Sustainability Consortium, and we've been supporting their efforts to try to bring in metrics that are much more quantitative in these areas. And you know, our goal is to have our entire food base tracked and measured over time. Now, that's really hard to do. And we talked to our suppliers about it. We said, look, we're going to stand up on stage. We're going to say we're going to do this just to warn you guys. Are you guys okay with this? And they said, yeah, we're not super okay with it, but we understand why you're doing it. You know, let's talk about how to make it doable and how to make it easy, and, but okay, we're there. And that's, that's, that's what we're doing, and it needs to be a whole system response in, the, in that way. Um, and our view is that by sending that demand signal, you do start to see the behavior change of people saying, yes, this is the right thing to do, and the systems start to follow. The innovation is there. Fourth thing. Oh, I'll just, yeah, let me just pause on this for a second and show you a couple examples. So I, I mentioned the greenhouse gas, women's economic empowerment. You know, we're looking at employment levels, economic mobility, as well as what it does to our sales. Disaster relief and preparation. You know, there's a recovery cost for Walmart uh, in the wake of disasters, but there's a recovery cost for society. I talked about the need to really quantify and apply a lot of creativity for this first column. But the same is true on the second column. Because if you're a business and you're investing in some of these things and you don't see how it's benefiting the business in some way, there will be a limit to how much of that you're willing to do or that you can do. So we really do believe it needs to be a win-win. Right? So our initiatives are not only about the societal impact. 
they also need to be sustainable from a business point of view as a portfolio. So if you're doing 10 things, there'll be a couple of them that actually don't help the business in any way at all. But eight of them should, so that as a collective portfolio, it's sustainable. And that's a really important point. You know, sometimes people go, what? That's not altruistic. You're just doing this to help yourself? No, <laughs> we're doing it to help society, but to make it sustainable, it also has to help the business. So that's, that's why we like this idea of the double bottom line. Um, fourth thing, and this is really key. In the foundation, so the Walmart Foundation, um, in the past, and this is true for most companies, if you looked at corporate philanthropy, it's what I would call checkbook philanthropy. So you have a budget, people come to you with great proposals, really good work, and you write the check to fund what they're doing. That's important, and a big part of what you know, we spend our mon money on is still that. So if you look at our store level grants program, or we also have a state level grants program in this country, a lot of it's that. Right? It's kind of open for business. Please send us your proposals. If it's a good proposal, the committee will vote yes and write you the check. Where the real impact is, though, is this, which is thinking quite strategically about what's the outcome you're trying to achieve. Is it lower greenhouse gas? Is it a higher smallholder farmer income? Is it more women in business? Is it um, disaster recovery time or cost? And with that in mind, work backward and say, okay, what's the integrated strategy that will do that? That is a combination of business initiatives and philanthropy, combination of Walmart actions, supplier actions, and everybody else, so government and other uh, companies, um, civil society, and so on. So thinking much more holistically. One of the organizations that is best at this is the Gates Foundation. I mean, this is what they do for a living. So they have their strategies. Polio, we're going to eradicate port, uh, polio you know, malaria, water and sanitation, and so on. And every single one of those strategies, they have what they call their theory of change that says what needs to happen to bring about that goal, and then their theory of action that says, okay, what's our unique role as the Gates Foundation? We're doing the same thing at Walmart. So we go, okay, what's the goal? We know we need to reduce water consumption in the food sector and greenhouse gas and freeze land and drive up yields. Okay, so what has to happen? And what can we do? And what should other people do? And then how do we convene folks to make that happen? And there are all kinds of things that we could do where we don't get involved because we think, you know what? We're actually not going to make that much difference. We used to have a big education program at the Walmart Foundation, K to 12 education. Big, I say, relative to what Walmart was spending money on, tiny and inconsequential in terms of what needs to happen to improve education in this country. So we got out of it because we looked at it and thought, you know what? We can't change the system. We're not really going to move the needle on this. So let's focus on the other things, things I showed you on that page. They're those ones we can make a difference on. So um, trying to drive systemic change is a big deal. So this workforce thing that we just announced in the last couple weeks is an example of that. So you know, Walmart, the company, made its announcements, as I said, about wages and scheduling practices and training programs and so on. And that, you know, that's fine for Walmart as an employer. We looked at it as a foundation and said, OK, well, what can we do? Well, we actually have a workforce development program. We had it for years. And I would say it was pretty traditional philanthropy. So we were writing checks to Goodwill. We were writing checks to the American Red Cross. They were doing great work training nurses at standing work. But it was all disaggregated investments so that our money was training individuals to get better jobs. We were not fixing the system. So we looked at it really over the last year and said, OK, in this country, in the world, there is a mismatch between the skills people have and the skills that employers want at the middle skill level. How do we accelerate people to go from entry level, their first job, to a better job? And how would we fix the system to do that? Working with other employers and education providers and those people to make it easier, especially underserved populations or people who are challenged. If I'm a single mother with two kids, it's going to be really hard for me to go back to school for two years, let alone four years. So what are more innovative ways for me to get those skills, to get credentials, and so on? So our new strategy is very systemic. It's working with many other employers, with many education providers, with many government agencies to say, how do we accelerate people moving from frontline to middle skills? And there's, it's a four-part strategy. Different people playing different roles or working in concert. And that's going to be much more impactful, we believe, than just writing the check. One example of this is in the food chain, and this will come back to USAID, is what you're seeing more and more of, the intersection of development and business to get triple bottom line impact at a systemic level. 
So development. What if you said, OK, cashews in Ghana, or sweet potatoes in another country? Farmers are there in Africa. They are producing crops. Ten, the yields tend to be very low. Quality tends to be poor. They don't have the processing infrastructure, so they're not getting great income for it. In the case of cashews, what happens is people grow them. They're kind of broken, not great quality. Some of them get gathered up. They literally get shipped to Asia for processing, and then they get shipped back again to Europe for consumption. Very inefficient. Tons of greenhouse gas. Just not a good setup. What if you said, OK, well, you know, there are people like USAID or DFID or CETA who have a real interest in elevating the income and the livelihoods of those farmers. And they can provide farmer training and so on to drive up yields, tools, practices, ag, ag practices. You've got private sector capital that's actually pretty interested in looking for opportunities on things like transportation, processing infrastructure. They want to invest in projects where they believe there's a return. And then you've got people like us who need a lot of cashews and are quite happy to do a long-term contract, set a fixed price that is very good for those farmers. And if you brought all those things together, you now have a viable project where your private capital is getting a return, the farmers are getting better yields, better livelihoods, the customers of the retailer are getting better product, you're not shipping it to Asia, you're sending it much closer. And because global demand for all these things is increasing in any case, you're actually not shortchanging the existing providers of capacity in Asia and other places. So these are the kinds of projects you're seeing more and more of. And what you end up with is a much better ag system at the end versus just providing aid in one component of this. Fifth point is about collaboration. You're gonna, you may have heard the phrase pre-competitive collaboration. You're going to hear that more and more, um, which is basically companies recognizing they need to work with each other, not in a way that contravenes any antitrust laws, but in a way that helps everybody pursue these social and environmental goals. So the example I gave around the UN Climate Change Summit and the commitment to measure ag yields and so on, um, that we did in concert with our suppliers. And they're going to share that information with each other. Um, that's one example. This is another example that's related to it. That's Doug McMillan doing a selfie here with a bunch of CEOs. You may recognize some of these people. Indra Nui, A.G. Laffley, this is a Pepsi, P&G, Kraft, um, Cargill, and so on, Campbell's. And um, these folks all came together here in Bentonville just uh, last April. They were at the Hammond Center. It's the only place that we really have conventions in Bentonville. And there we are at the Hammond Center. And Doug is taking this selfie. These guys had just made two commitments. So one was to create something called the closed loop fund. All of these companies sell products that are sold in bottles or cans or other things that really should be recycled. Uh, and we've been asking them to increase the recycled content in their packaging and all these things. And they say to us, oh, we'd love to, but we just can't get recycled material. It's really hard. Americans don't recycle as much as they need to. So we said, OK, well, let's create a fund. Let's create a $100 million fund. And it's going to be a zero loan facility for municipalities. And cities can borrow money from this fund to build recycling infrastructure to drive up recycling in their cities. And then that would get you guys more content. And then we'd have more recycling in the country. And they said, OK, let's do it. So we did it. So these guys had just committed to create that fund. And they've each kicked in 5 to $10 million, depending on the size of the company. And then the second commitment that they made that day was around fertilizer, um, which is part of the broader UN commitment. So they agreed to take specific acreage that is under their control in their own food chains and work with us to reduce fertilizer applications to drive out GHG. So it'll be about 10 million metric tons of fertilizer reduction just from this one commitment. And it's very specific acreage. You know, Kellogg's, it's some rice fields. General Mills, it's oat fields in Canada, and, and so on and so forth. And we're working with Environmental Defense Fund on it. So that is a collaboration across people who are actually pretty fierce competitors, but willing to say, OK, you know what? This is the right thing to do for the environment. It's important for our own constituents. It's the responsible thing. And so you know, we'll agree to do it. So that this shot kind of went around on, on the internet. They called it the trillion dollar selfie, because if you added up the total turnover of all these companies, it, it was in excess of a trillion dollars in the food system. So it was, it was pretty funny. And then the last one is about driving um, this double bottom line, thinking deep into the organization. 
So it would be one thing if, you know, for Walmart, if Walmart said, oh, yeah, you know, we care about sustainability. And Kathleen, you know, that's great. You have your team. You guys go do it. That's never going to work. It has to be in the merchant mentality, um, the operators, the real estate people, the logistics people, and so on. Um, and that's so key. Every company that I can think of, the Unilevers of the world, the NRGs, it's totally part and parcel of the day job of people in those companies. So that means leadership. Uh, is committed and it's part of their vision. If you talk to Doug and you say, Doug, you know, what's your legacy? Why are you, why did you say yes to lead Walmart? What are you trying to do? He will not say, I love selling stuff and I want to sell as much stuff as I can. He will say, save money and live better, our core proposition. We are trying to make cost of living lower for people. And we want to do it in a way that lowers the true cost of living for society. So we actually have the wherewithal to work on environmental issues and social issues back in the chain. And that's, what, that's why I am here. And actually, we had a sustainability milestone meeting last uh, Tuesday. We do this every six months to check in on all those goals that I talked about. And um, it's actually online. If you go to the Walmart site, you'll see it. The first five minutes of the milestone meeting is Doug talking about what does he see as his legacy and what's Walmart trying to do. It's incredibly compelling. I recommend it if you're looking for a couple minutes, you know, waiting for the bus or something, look at it. Um, but you'll see he talks about that. And that's crucial. And then, as I said, it's got to be driven into the day job of everybody. So if you look at merchants at Walmart, they get measured on their P&L, and they get measured on their sustainability progress uh, against the index. If you look at the real estate people, they are getting measured on their implementation uh, of all of the um, energy efficiency improvements, HVAC, LED lights, all those things, and renewable energy. Are we, are we working toward our goal? So there's a very specific timetable they have to work against. So that is part of the day jobs of people, and it's how they think about their purpose in the company. And that's, that's, uh, that's really important. So that is basically it. Um, you know, this is just an example of how it all comes together, but I've talked about this quite a bit already. I'd love to just, you know, perhaps open it up to questions and discussion and hear what's on your mind and how do you, what do you see from all this happening in your part uh, of the world? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now open up the floor to questions. We have um, two microphones on either side of the room, so uh, if you just raise your hand if you have questions, we'll call on you. And remember to stay, um, speak into the microphone. This is being recorded. And state your name and hometown and classification. Thanks. Um, my name's Ash. Mm -hmm. I'm from India. Mm. And I'm uh, an MBA candidate at the Sam Walton uh, College of Business. Okay. I had a sort of two-part question, actually. Um, one part of it has to do with the pre-competitive alliances. Mm -hmm. And I know you talked a little bit about um, making alliances with suppliers and um, mm -hmm. with other non-governmental organizations yeah. and so on. But how does that work for Walmart in terms of with competitors, both mm -hmm. within the United States and outside? Mm -hmm. So other retailers that yes. are doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. And the second part of it is more um, directly related to the United States, I guess. Um, there has been this sort of localized move to eat locally and mm -hmm. source locally yeah. and be able to, um, especially within a certain certain economic um, group, I think, with access to resources, a move to um, eat food that, that comes from where you know it comes from. Um, yeah. How does that play into Walmart's um, being able to scale that mm -hmm. across the board? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, to your first question, the retail collaboration. Um, it happens in a couple of ways. So one is there has been an explosion in bodies that exist to facilitate collaboration. So some have been around a long time, like the Consumer Goods Forum is one that we belong to. That's the preeminent organization for retailers and suppliers in consumer goods uh, globally. And that organization has a number of committees focused on particular environmental and social outcomes. So there's a health and wellness committee, there's a sustainability committee, there's a responsible sourcing committee, and each of those have um, established shared aspirations and commitments. So for example, the sustainability com uh, committee has agreed to zero net deforestation 
in palm oil, soy, beef, and so on. We've signed on to that. Reta other retailers, competitors have signed on to that. So that becomes a really important forum to drive like-mindedness. Um, other examples would be the World Council for Sustainable Business, TSC, right, the Sustainability Consortium, which, which is a multi-retailer um, subscription. So you know, you've got Kroger that's experimenting with different categories now, and uh, Marks and Spencer, uh, Macy's, and so on. So there are those forums, but there's also direct collaboration. So the example I showed you with the selfie was just us calling them up and saying, look, why don't we just do this? And it's going to be quicker. Sometimes it's quicker just to do that. So we're, do we're working on something right now with Target on chemicals. So our commitment to re reduce or remove outright uh, what we call chemicals of concern, we've been working on it for a long time with Environmental Defense Fund. Target had been thinking along similar lines and had some of their own initiatives. So we actually joined forces and created a beauty and personal care summit with them a few months ago. And, and we're now pursuing joint action on this because we realized, you know, there's safety in numbers trying to go to the suppliers and say, look, we really needed to do this. So you're going to see more, more and more of that. And sorry, your second question? Oh, you were talking about local manufacturing. Yeah, so yeah, there's a huge move to manufacture and consume things locally, which makes a lot of sense, right? Why would you ship things around the world if you can produce them locally? Um, so we've tried to come at that a couple of different ways. Uh, one is just in terms of local produce. So we had set a goal to double the availability of locally grown produce in our stores, and, and we are close to achieving that. Um, I think last year we sold $700 million worth of locally, or maybe it was 700 million pounds. Get my stats mixed up. We'll be publishing it next month in our, our global responsibility report. But hundreds of millions of dollars in pounds of locally grown produce in our stores. You know, a lot of times people think, oh, Walmart, you know, it's global. You must get all of your produce from across the ocean. But that's actually not true. We're trying to do it locally as well. It's better footprint uh, for the environment. Um, the second is our local manufacturing initiative. So we, we've started in the U.S. We said we would buy an incremental $250 billion worth of product at cost, so cost of goods sold on that basis, um, from U.S. manufacturers for the U.S. market. I think you can expect to see more of that kind of thing. You know, even in China, uh, there's been a huge uptick because of the growth of the Chinese economy in the Chinese manufacturing capacity, which initially was created to serve all of the rest of the world serving local Chinese customers. So I think you're going to see a rebalancing and a resorting of where stuff's getting produced and who is it for more locally. And, and we're actually trying to accelerate that. Great. You can tell us the inside story. How did it feel from the inside? <laughs> I actually wanted to tell you, um, just share a little anecdote that directly preceded when you came in October. Yeah. Uh, I'm Alexis Denny Kaufman. Hi. And, um, and Dean Veda and Dean Rome, you know, we, we all met a few years ago and Raj came here. And I would say that was the inspiration for an enhanced collaboration with Walmart because he sat down with yeah. Doug and then Mike Duke at the time. And it was exactly after Walmart had acquired MassMart. So you yeah. showed the photograph of MassMart yeah. in South Africa, which didn't at the time have grocery throughout the continent. Right. And so we looked at the situation and we met with various people at Walmart. And we said, well, you're expanding into 13 countries in Africa in grocery. And you need to find farmers that are close to those stores. We have farmers. We want to train those farmers. Mm -hmm. um, if we train those farmers, you're going to get your cashews, and you're going to get other product, and you're going to get it cheaper and faster, and also make the communities more happy about mm -hmm. you being there and participating. And so we looked consciously at how yeah. could we move this program out of the foundation somewhat and into the core business right. and merge those values. And so at what came out of our time in Arkansas, that started here was this merging exactly the values yeah. that you're talking about. And I, I, you would know better than I, but I believe there are four or five countries now in Africa yeah. and it had begun in Latin America. Yeah. And one of the ways is something really simple. And so where you guarantee a certain price and a certain purchase, assuming it meets quality. And that way a farmer knows that they have the money and they know that they can invest in inputs. And I just use that as an example of how for all the students, very spontaneously a collaboration yeah. can come together. Yeah. Um, if you just sort of overlay, we basically just took our map of where we were in Africa and your map of where you were in Africa, mm -hmm. overlaid it and said, okay, what do they need to get? What do we need to do? And it, yeah. it really fit 
almost perfectly. And I think that in any sort of problem solving set that comes up down the road in any of these goals, there's probably other examples where that can happen. Yeah. So I just wanted to share sort of yeah. how that came to be. It's and great to hear that backstory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it happened here. Yeah. So that's neat. Okay, next question. We'll get you in a second. Thank you so much for, for making time to talk to us. There's something so powerful and so compelling about what Walmart is doing. Nevertheless, I feel that the system itself is dependent on a deeper inequity. Um, for example, it'd be possible impossible to pay a factory worker, you know, in China or Vietnam as much as an hourly associate mm -hmm. in the States, even taking, say, purchase price parity into account. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think there's always going to be winners and losers. In light of this observation, do you think that even Walmart's efforts will always be a, an uphill battle doomed to, to failure? Um, it's a very important question that you're asking. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was over in China last August and talked to a lot of factory workers and managers and so on. And they were saying that it is increasingly hard for them to find workers because of the tightening of the market there for labor. And that the wages have had to go up substantially in the last couple of years. Cities are getting developed. There's so many more opportunities for people. And I think that's just the natural progression that you see of their industrial revolution that we went through in our own country you know, 100 years ago. Um, I'm really inspired by folks like Nick Kristof. I don't know if you've read his works. He's a columnist at the New York Times. He wrote a beautiful book with his wife, Cheryl Wudun, called Half the Sky, which is about the treatment of women globally. It's quite moving. But one of the arguments he makes that's surprising, because I think people didn't expect him to be making this argument, but it was, look, you know, we may look at those factories and say, well, I wouldn't want a job like that. I don't want to earn that salary. But in that context, um, you know, the development curve is so steep, and it's going so much more quickly than it did in our society 100 years ago. If you look at a Taiwan, for example, and where it is now versus where it was 50 years ago, that, that economic development uh, is actually a really great thing. And if we can ensure a few things, number one, that the basic conditions, the workers' safety and health is being taken care of, which it's not in all countries. And we can talk more about that. But you know, that's the bare minimum. But then are there ways to elevate and accelerate the development um, of the people, as well as those sectors, so that they get to uh, a much more elevated state more quickly? And, and that's sort of how we're thinking of it. You know, we, we've done a number of things around, um, for example, the women's program, uh, Women in Factories. So this is a program that we developed with CARE and SWASTI and World Vision and BSR and some others to work with women in factories to help them find their voice, to find higher potential women and elevate them to managerial positions. Because we agree, we, we would like to see that accelerate, that development accelerate. Cal, we have a question right here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Spencer. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm getting my master's in agricultural economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've noticed, just on a personal level, a lot more organic offerings mm -hmm. in Walmart yep. in the recent years. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if things like the Wild Oats brand mm -hmm. and increase in organic greens and things like that are linked to your goals and chemical reduction, or mm. if it's also linked to consumer trends and just how the organic offerings fit into your larger narrative here. Yeah. Yeah, there has been a real uptick in organics offering because that's what the customer is asking for. You know, Walmart is always thinking, what is the customer asking and let's try to deliver that. Um, so yeah, and then the second thing is this belief that it shouldn't be more expensive than anything else. So I think there's still a bit of a price parity, but if you look at an organic offering at Walmart relative to some competitors, it's much cheaper at Walmart. And that's also very conscious, is how can we make it so that it shouldn't cost more um, for people if that's, you know, if that's how you want to uh, eat. I have to say from a sustainability point of view, um, my view is that we need biotech um, and that we're going to need some things that don't qualify as organic because they've been modified, right? So whether it's a drought-resistant seed or a vitamin A fortified seed, 
Uh, I think we're going to need that as part of the solution. But we need organic methods too. And the farms I've seen that are most exciting are ones that combine those kinds of things. So I think more from a sustainability point of view, I think it's going to be less about let's drive organics and it's going to be more let's optimize the ag practices so that we're preserving pollinator health, we're reducing water pollution, we're driving yields, and it's going to be a bit of a mixture of all those kind of techniques, not, not just organics is my own bias. Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Will. I'm actually going with that. I was going to ask you earlier. So mm. you mentioned in your presentation mm. we need 78% more food by 2050. Mm. Um, so that's a lot more food. But you also mentioned um, we can't use more land. Right. But there also is a pushback with the organic and also the GMO issue. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see how do you see those two intersecting? Like how are we going to make more food by trying to also you know help these consumers mm -hmm. be confident with their eating and if they want to eat GMO free or if they want organic? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there is there a middle ground between these two issues or is one of them going to have to budge? Yeah, so um, I think there are a couple things that give me hope about that scary statistic. One is waste, food waste, right? So if you look um, at that 70% figure, half of it we can tackle by eliminating food waste. And a big chunk of that's upstream, and it's, it has to do with lack of processing infrastructure and transportation infrastructure to get crops to, um, to market. It has to do with specs that... You know, a retailer will come along and say, I only want the beautiful peaches and I don't want the other ones versus saying, well, I'll take them all and I'll put some of them in jam and some, you know. So there's some efficiencies that we need to drive there. And then in the homes, we've got a big date labeling initiative we're doing to try to demystify the best buy whatever date. And people think, oh, I can't eat this. And they throw it away. So we're going to be running some campaigns, some ads actually at checkout telling people, you know, what can you do with food that's past the best buy date? When is it not safe and when is it okay? Um, so there's a bunch of that kind of stuff. Um, second thing that gives me hope is yield curves. So if you look at yield curves, in other words, production per acre uh, of any crop in different regions of the world, it's a massive curve. And there are some um, practices, forget about you know, GMOs and, and so just, just better farming practices that would help improve those yields. And that's going to solve a bunch of the problems. So the kind of stuff that USAID is doing in these, in these markets is so vital. That alone will help a lot. Then I think you do come and say, OK, well, that, both of those things probably don't get you all the way there. You are going to need to, to consider some other levers. And um, I think the short answer is we don't know. So I'm not saying all GMOs are wonderful. Let's modify every seed. But I'm saying I think we're going to need some biotech. And there's a lot we don't know. So for example, um, neonicotinoids. Right? We're quite worried about pollinator health and the jury's out so the USDA is doing some studies we haven't seen the results yet you know are those neonicotinoids causing the problem or not we don't know I don't know and you know there are some um, GMOs or people would argue look it's not the seed itself it's not that there's a human health hazard it's the practices of the farmers who are using those seeds who then dump a bunch of herbicide on them and then that causes other problems so these are not simple issues. I think we need to take them one by one by one and do the problem solving in the field uh, and actually optimizing for these, um, these different objectives of yield, water quality, pollinator health, uh, greenhouse gas. And again, my bias is we're going to need a mix of things. But I, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's going to vary case by case. Hi, my name is Meredith McKee. I'm the assistant MBA director. And um, my question pertains to the African context again. And I'm going to use Senegal as an example because I've lived there. Mm -hmm. So in Senegal, there's a very vibrant outdoor food market where for you know, a mile, you can walk and you mm -hmm. can um, buy tons of amazing produce, but all from very, very small um, sellers, um, a lot of women. And um, in the town I was in, about 100,000 people, there was one small grocery store. We called it the European store. The food was all imported, and it was very expensive. Mm. And so I'm just trying to visualize what happens in this context when you try to bring in a grocery store, which has the positive benefit of having um, a lot more food cheaper than, for example, the imports. Mm -hmm. But what happens to this mass market where half the town is making their living off of selling, you know, their, you know, where a woman is selling 
a couple kilos of tomatoes a day, and that's her livelihood. So what does um, Walmart do when it comes into a town and tries to um, start a store there? Yeah. So, so the reality is um, Walmart probably wouldn't put a store there because there wouldn't be enough income to support that kind of organized retail offer. So if you look at where a store is actually viable, um, it tends to be in places that are more urbanized already. There's some manufacturing base. You've got a certain level of income that can support organized retail trade. It, it wouldn't be um, in some of those smaller areas. So that, that's, you know, there's actually, it's interesting. If you look at Africa and you say, what is, back to your point, where does Walmart have food stores today? It's actually not many places for that reason. There aren't that many communities that can support it from an economic point of view. So our focus these days is more about sourcing and working with folks like USAID and others to um, work with smallholders. And, and the goal isn't to aggregate them and turn them into industrial farms, but it's to support that system that's already there and improve it in terms of yields um, and to the extent that it, it, it does benefit them in terms of having another outlet to sell that produce, having a place for it to go and get a better price. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. My name is Haley, and I am an MBA student at the Walton College and work with Startup Junkie Consulting, who works with Walmart on some of the women empowerment and mm -hmm. the women entrepreneurship. So I think that that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But my question actually is on the sustainability consortium. I know I read an article recently about maybe like 3,000 products have been identified as sustainable mm -hmm. products. How do you see that going on in the future? How do you scale that type of system where you're identifying which products are sustainable to a global scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the 3,000 actually refers to 3,000 items being okay. sold by suppliers that score above an 80% threshold on the index. So it's a little, it's, it's, so what we just did was last week we announced on walmart.com what we call our sustainable sustainability leaders shop. And what we've done is we've taken the sustainability index, and for every single category, you know, there's a series of questions that our suppliers answer, and it's like anything else in life. There's a distribution, best supplier scores and worst supplier scores. We've taken that distribution and we've said, we're just gonna, for simplicity state, take the top 20% of suppliers based on their scores in that category and feature them and their products within that category. So it is not necessarily the case that their items are sustainable. It's that the items they're selling come from suppliers who are at least working on this index. Because what we're trying to drive is the behavior that says, okay, I get it, I care about these issues, I'm making progress, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of in the lead of my category. So that's what that is. Um, and yeah, it's 3,000 items. It actually works out to be about 12,000 um, unique, f what we call flavors, right? So eight flavors of the one ice cream kind of thing. Um, that meet that test. And so our goal is just to get more and more of them you know, into that bucket. We'd love to see more and more people move up above that threshold in terms of scores on the index. And already it's been incredible, the reaction from suppliers. You know, People saying, oh, oh gosh, I actually haven't looked at my scores in a while. Oh my goodness, I didn't, how did I not make it in this category? What do I need to do differently? Which is exactly the behavior we're trying to drive, is that excitement and kind of rejuvenation to, to tackle those um, issues. Um, my name is Lauren Altima, and I'm a hospitality and restaurant man management major from um, South Lake, Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, I just got back from studying um, the food service industry in Italy. And mm -hmm. kind of going off of the question about Senegal, um, whenever I was in Italy, pretty much everyone shopped from the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of direct contact with the farmers. And there is a passion for the artisan craft yeah. behind different kinds of food and just on a basic level whether you were a chef or not or high income low income everyone just had a knowledge of health and how to make mm -hmm. just make simple food um, and it wasn't complicated or expensive but um, so I feel like that's has some sort of an issue to do with why people don't have a passion or interest in really cooking here mm -hmm. is there any way that as a company, Walmart has thought of connecting the whole process of how farmers work to the population slash um, mm -hmm. with wine making or just other things that there's mm -hmm. just so, such a passion and knowledge for there that 
there's such a disconnect here. Is there any awareness of that or anything that Walmart's doing to connect <laughs> the population to the um, farmers or mm -hmm. just other like pasta or anything like any sort of makers of anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, um, a couple things. So one is, as I was saying before, just education on how to cook and nutrition and so on, which we're doing primarily through the foundation, through grants to people. It's nothing to do with Walmart, right? It's, it's us funding people like Share Our Strength and others who work in that space. Because you're right, I think America, the average American doesn't know how to cook and doesn't know where their food came from. And, and that's an issue in terms of just health and wellness. You know, as we've looked at it, the, the two indicators that we've found correlate best with health are consumption of fruits and vegetables and meals cooked at home. And those are skills people just don't, they haven't acquired for whatever reason. So that, that's one. What we've started to think about is what role could the company play in that? And these days with mobile devices, um, you know, technology, you can make it a lot easier to give people tools to learn about food, to cook, to get recipes, to shop on a budget in a healthy way, all these kinds of things. ASDA, which is one of the Walmart companies globally in the UK, is probably the farthest along, and they have all these tools that they've offered to customers. Now, interestingly, people don't use them. They're available for free online. You can go to ASDA and say, I have 100 pounds to spend. What should I cook? Here's the five recipes. Give me my shopping list. So that alone isn't going to do it. It's more of a cultural thing, you know, to your point, but we are trying to drive that. And then the other one is just transparency. Where does my food come from? People don't know where their food comes from. Um, and we want to change that for a couple reasons. One is you should have an informed decision when you're making your purchases. Um, but, but second, we're trying to also drive transparency just for food safety, for compliance with regulations around worker safety and so on. We would love to get to a world beyond audits. I mean, these days with technology, you know, today the way it works in the industry is you have audit teams that go around and audit factories or farms. We would love to get to the point where anybody, any citizen at any time with the camera could take a picture and say, I'm standing here, it is date stamped, it's GPS coordinates stamped at this time, this is what's going on, there's the evidence, it's uploaded, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? You wouldn't need to send out an audit team because you'd actually be getting your information real time from places. I think one of the most exciting developments is in technology. And I'll just give you one example. Google Earth has just done a deal with the World Resource Institute um, to monitor forests of the world to prevent deforestation. So they have mapped the entire world of forests. And you know how when you go on Google Earth and you like look up your house and the photo's two years out of date? and it's, This is real time. This is real time photography of the forest. So you can monitor clearing. You can see what's happening to the people walking around in that forest, right? You can look at forest fires. And that is an incredible tool. So if we could get you know, to using that to have true transparency about where does my food come from? This cantaloupe came from this field. What's happening in that field? Um, that's where we would love to, to get. We have time for one more question. Yeah, my name is Joshua, and um, I'm a double major in computer science and agribusiness. I'm from Ghana. I'm um, kind of relating my question to what my sister said. Uh, Ghana is kind of about 60% uh, into agriculture, and we have a lot of open market. Like you said, it's hard for Walmart to penetrate in such system. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is, in case Walmart decide to enter into that market, in spite of whatever is around, like China and other countries are rushing into Africa, mm -hmm. opening such business and making money, how will you face those challenges in order to control the system, to make it more accessible? So your question is, if we were to have a retail store in Ghana, what we would do to yeah, make sure that... Yeah, open market. To preserve the open market? In spite of the open market, how can you get control of the system? To get control of the... Uh, of which system? Uh, our marketing system, so that you can... Like, it is done in U.S., yeah, it's kind of closed market where everyone goes to Walmart to mm -hmm. shop. Uh -huh. But back in Africa or Ghana, it's open. Yeah. Everyone is selling. You just walk anywhere, buy whatever you right. want, and you can negotiate for prices. Yep, this yeah. is a very different. Well, um, you know, if you look at retailers that have expanded into other markets and have done well, every single one of them has had to tailor their format to work in the local cultural context. And when they failed, it's because they didn't do that. So to your point about Italy, you know, a lot of people have tried to go into Italy or to go into Germany or some of these other countries, and they've all failed. 
uh, various points because they didn't know how to adapt that format for that market and it wasn't relevant to the local customers. And I think what you're talking about is another example of that. You know, I think if you showed up tomorrow with an American style grocery store, I'm not sure it would do that well because people would say, well, what am I going to do with this? And why would I, you know, it's just a different culture and a different set of shopping habits. Um, so, you know, when you look around the world and see who has done well in retail, they've had to work with that cultural context. And sometimes what they come up with is really unrecognizable. You know, if you go, if you go to a Walmart store in China, for example, you'll notice two things. One is there's the store and it looks like a lot of other Chinese stores where you walk in and there's a lot of sampling going on and all kinds of things, frogs and snakes and <laughs> you name it, which you would never find down in Fayetteville. Um, but there's also an, a massive online business. Yaodian is the Walmart online business in China because the densities are so high, people living in these condos, that home delivery is a lot more practical. You know, it's hard for people. They don't have a car to get into and drive to some market. They're, they need somebody to deliver things to the concierge of their condo complex. So the mix of online and physical in that country is a lot different, and what they're selling is totally different. It's unrecognizable, the fresh food market in a Walmart in China. So, um, so I, I, think, I think if we were to put a store in Ghana, it would be unrecognizable. It would, certainly wouldn't look like the Walmart Supercenter. Okay. We'd just yeah. like to thank you again. Thank you. Uh, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Okay. We hope everyone has um, enjoyed today, and we have some refreshments in the hall that everyone is welcome to stay and, and mingle. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Christina.